Still not sure whether to take the ACT or the SAT? This is The Coaching Educator with Rebecca M. Carroll. Stay tuned and find out what's going on with this era of change. So the biggest question that I get asked all the time, and and it's a it's a valid question, is which one should I take, the SAT or the ACT? Which one do colleges like more? So students are tested in a variety of ways by the college. We have aptitude and understanding. We have common core standards. We also have AP and IB knowledge. And then we have our languages other than English. We come to the SAT and the ACT, which many, many colleges use as one of their requirements for admissions. So let's just dive right in. We're going to look at both of them. The SAT is administered from the College Board, which also runs the AP programs and the PSAT programs. The ACT is administered by ACT.org. And frankly, they're both good. They're just very different. So do you need to take both of them? No, you do not. Sometimes you don't even need to take an SAT or an ACT. Certain community colleges do not require it. However, if you take one and you score a certain score, you're able to be put right into a certain class like English 101 or your math class, college algebra, depending upon your score. So there's benefits to going ahead and taking it. Next, you wanna check to see if any of your colleges are interested if they're required. There are over 700 accredited or test optional colleges that exist out there. They're basically being very flexible about a test score. 520 of them are highly ranked. So it's important for you to know that, that it's not just you know, lower end colleges or colleges that are state schools or, you know, things like that. So test optional means that you do not have to or you're not required to submit them. Test blind means that they're going to be looking at your application and your admissions portfolio that they've required, but they're not going to be looking at the test scores for admission purposes. If you want to learn more about the different colleges, we're going to put this link, www.fairtest.org. It would be really important for you to go ahead and look at that and see if your college or a college that you're matching up well with is on that list. Why might I need to take an SAT or an ACT test? Many colleges require it for minimum test scores. They have a certain level. They want to make sure that you're going to be successful at their particular school. More selective colleges oftentimes see high scores as a commitment to academic excellence. More selective colleges oftentimes look at high test scores as a way for them to see that your abilities are quite high academically and that you are someone who is prepared for their college. Even test optional or test blind colleges may use test scores just as a way of determining merit aid. And that is why I always recommend that you take your SAT or ACT because many of these schools, it's tied to that. They look at your GPA, your class rank, as well as your test scores. And then they select, they have these students who they select for certain scholarships. Some colleges use their test scores as far as placement into English and math. That's what I was talking about with the community colleges, as well as they are used as far as uh, regular colleges, state colleges, to make sure that you are academically prepared and are capable of passing a first year math, college math that they're expecting or requiring you to take. Colleges for the most part want you to be successful. The last thing they need is 
a student who's in a class who it's above their academic level, they haven't learned a certain amount or they don't understand it. So the goal is with assessments is to make sure that you are prepared for certain classes. And as you're applying to colleges and you find out that you do need to submit test scores, find out which one you're better at and focus on that one. All colleges will accept an ACT or an SAT score and neither of them care which one you submit. So no college is going to be more interested in one over the other. So be confident in that. Can I try a pretest? Yes. Many, many public schools offer a PSAT in 10th and 11th grade. It's nice for you to be able to practice and get your feet wet on a standardized test. And that will help you understand what it feels like to be timed, what the expectations are, and it also will help you see, okay, I might need to work at this a little. So I really recommend that you take that practice test in 10th grade. It is offered again in 11th grade. It counts a little more. It's, uh, it falls under the umbrella of the National Merit Scholarship Qualifying Test, which then helps identify you as someone who potentially could be a National Merit Scholar. You really do have to score uh, in the highest percentiles and you would be competing for National Merit Scholars. And I will be talking in another video about what that looks like and the work that goes into that and the colleges that really reward National Merit Scholars in another one. But for now, we're just talking about it's worth taking it. It helps you to see where your scores are. It's not required by any of the colleges. However, it gives you a baseline, a baseline as to how well you're going to be doing and how much work you need to put into your test prep. The ACT also has a pre-ACT through high schools as well. Many high schools do not do this though, but it would be important for you to go to your school counselor and ask if there's a way that you can get that because some people really do enjoy the ACT and test better. So a pre-SAT pre is different though than that ACT Aspire, which many schools use to test yearly how their students are doing. So please don't confuse them. It's important for you though to know that uh, a lot of stuff is free online just to practice. It would be worth going on to those sites. So let's get down to the meat of things. SAT or ACT. An ACT is a content-based test. It has four sections, your English, your math, your reading, and science. Many people who do well in the reading portion oftentimes do well in the science portion because you are basically reading, but it's scientific material. There is an optional essay. I encourage you to take at least one test with an essay. The rest of them you don't need. It has a composite score that goes up to 36. Basically, it's the average of all four of those subsets that you're taking. Students can now retake sections, but you do have to take the test once first. That's important for you to know. Super scoring becomes more, is more popular with many of the colleges, and you can find all the information on the ACT and how they test and things like that at the ACT.org, which we will be putting in our script below. An SAT is evidence-based reading and content. It has two sections, math and reading and writing, which is one, it's combined, the section. It has an optional essay. And again, I would take the essay once, at least take the essay once. Many colleges require it. If your school is offering the ACT or the SAT, and generally they are offering it without writing, you can actually go and ask to be able to take the writing. It's my understanding that the schools will allow a student who approaches them early enough. So if you wanna have the opportunity to take the writing and they're offering it at your school and giving that ACT or SAT for free, it would be important for you to go do that. Each section it scores from 200 to 800 points in math or reading and writing. And for it's a potential of 1600. 
Super scoring is also common with this. Many colleges will ask for your highest score. You can find more information on at collegeboard.org. So which one? The ones that highlight your strength is basically the one that you're going to be wanting to do. If you can take a practice test, that would be very important for you to do to see and then focus on the one you're better at. The SAT, you need more time to think through the questions. You are confident with fill in the blank math questions and no calculator problems. That's important for you to understand. Many people think because the ACT ha goes up to a higher math level that that, you know, should be the determination. But it's really not. It's whether or not you feel comfortable without a calculator and how well you can calculate math problems without a calculator. You do not, if you do not like science, uh, the science section, which is basically reading research and graphing and things like that on the ACT, you would be more inclined to do the SAT. And are you good at evaluating arguments? You're reading and you're evaluating what is being said within the paragraphs. Those are your keys. Oftentimes, people who have had a classical education, they oftentimes gravitate over to the SAT. But that doesn't mean for sure that you should be taking that. The ACT, we, you know, these are based on people's responses. If you're quick and comfortable with speed, if you're okay with being timed, if you can move quickly through any of the problems or read quickly and dissect what it, you need to within that paragraph, the ACT is probably your best bet. If you love geometry, there is three times as many geometry questions on the ACT. And you may not have known that your particular ninth or 10th grade math class incorporated geometry. So if you didn't have a pure geometry that don't fret because many times, especially with the math models courses, that is helpful. You are, another way you can tell is if you're good at interpreting scientific data. And like I said, many people who score high in the reading section tend to be able to read the data, interpret it. It is new to them. Many times students have not even experienced this kind of reading. So I would go ahead and look at, go to the act.org and look at some practice tests or practice assessments or practice questions that are available for you to see how they frame the scientific section of this. Also, if you prefer to produce and argue your own opinion, then the ACT is the one for you. Another really big question that I get asked often is, when do I take the SAT or ACT? I really recommend spring of junior year is typically the best time for students. Fit it in to your different schedules. Many of you are involved with music or competitive dance or you're, you have a spring sport. And that's how you would determine if you're gonna be doing it early spring or later spring or in the, within the summer. It's important though for you to decide this and plan it out. Spring testing allows for more preparation and the ability to retake it in the fall as your, in your senior year if needed. Recruited students such as athletes, I really recommend taking it in December. The first weekend of December and the second weekend of December is an SAT and then followed up by an ACT. We need these scores early. It's important. It's important to get your scores in the NCAA for coaches to be able to see that you're academically able to handle their particular college. Some colleges may frown upon taking the test more than two or three times. So it is important for you. Many of the California schools do not like to see that. So be strategic, get your baseline, really, really test prep. There's no reason to not and build it into your school schedule. A few notes about score reports. You send your score reports directly from the act.org or collegeboard.org. Both ACT and SAT allow students to select four colleges to send for free. Many kids get really tense about this. 
If you are unsure or if you have, through practice, identified that you really need to raise your score in order to qualify for a school that you're looking at, it would be important to not place any any of your high-end or reach schools on this particular score report. Both ACT and SAT allow students to select four colleges when they are filling out their application for their testing. It's important for you to, to think about which colleges that you would like to send it to. If you're concerned or you, do have never, you don't have a baseline on your scores, you might want to pause and be a little cautious about which schools you're placing in there. I really encourage you, though, to do the, your state colleges. If you are a recruited athlete who's going to be attending a community college, it's important to get those sent there. So be strategic. It takes time and, and not just to put colleges in before you have an understanding. You can actually register for the ACT or the SAT without putting your colleges in. It's important though that you put them in if you have decided that you're going to before you take the test because you can't add them after. So, so use caution, but also understand that it's not a bad thing to do that. So you want to um, definitely enhance your application by having the scores go to the college pretty quickly. Okay, how are SAT and ACT scores reported? So some colleges will ask for your highest test sitting, highest test date sitting, that's it. Some colleges will do uh, split them up and super score, and you'll be able to put the date of each one. Uh, that you may have done a higher score in your English at the end of your junior year in the spring, but you may have had a higher math score on another test that you've taken. So it's important for you to know what the schools want and be strategic. Some highly selective colleges expect that every single one of the scores that you take every single one you have to report so that's important to know and if you're looking at ROTC ROTC recommends taking it as much as possible to improve that score to improve your chances so know your college know who your audience is and make sure you understand which ones recommend how many times you take it you can solve the problem best by definitely building test prep into your life, even though you're busy, and I know it's hard, but having a great score is going to help you tremendously. Test prep is worth it, as I was saying. It will definitely show commitment. It will show that you are self-motivated to improve your score, and that's important, and colleges like self-motivated students. It will also help. Don't just take the test and think, well, I've taken, I've taken it once, so now I know how to take it. You need to study in between. Be strategic, look at your scores. You can print out your score report and it will actually tell you where you're, you need, what subject portion. It will actually show you where you need to improve and you can start tackling those things. So different types of test preps include self-study books. You can also do group review sessions if your school offers one. I know when I was working at a public school, I used to go in, in, the, in uh, early in the morning and work with juniors and seniors on test prep. So there might be someone at your school offering it. We offer it. We build it into our program because we, are, we know how important it is for scores and how scholarships are tied to scores. So if you have any experiences with taking an ACT or an SAT, please put it in the comments section. If you like what you're hearing and you think someone else will benefit, please like and share this video because it's important for students to know and understand the SAT and the ACT so that they can feel more confident when approaching them. So, Test day tips. I can't tell you enough. Please try to go to bed early. It would be the best thing for you to get a good night's sleep. 
you need to bring some sort of photo ID because your photo is on your ticket and you need to identify that that's who you are. Make sure it's the same name on the ID. Also, you need to bring a, a pre, you need to bring an approved calculator to number two pencils. I would encourage you to bring a water bottle. I would encourage you to bring a snack. A lot of students would like uh, like to time their themselves and look at the their watch. Make sure that you don't have it on loud. So have it on silent, and you can keep track of yourself and pace yourself better and a sweater because believe it or not if the room you're in is freezing that's really hard to work on a test so those are the things that we always encourage kids to do also show up 20 minutes early and make sure you do a couple of practice problems and that will help you it's important for you to do that many colleges ask for subject tests they some programs, like an engineering program, will oftentimes tell you which ones they want you to take and others say it's up to you. College Board has 20 subject tests in five different subject areas. Some selective schools require two or three subject tests. It's important to check, like I said. Many of them will list it very clearly under the major. So not only do you need to check the school, you need to check within your major as well. Double check it. It's best and recommended that you take these tests when you are potentially taking AB or IB classes within the same subject. Generally, it is recommended the first weekend of May. That's the, you're in the midst of taking your AP exams and they feel, this is the recommendation, that the subject tests you are well prepared for, and it's the best time to take your first subject test. Now again, there are many athletes that that weekend, the first weekend of May, is complicated for them to try to take a subject test. So don't worry if you can't take them then. The tests can help demonstrate strengths. Oftentimes, the majority of my students who take subject tests love them better because they're really focused in that particular area, and it's generally their strong area. They take about 45 minutes. You can take three in a sitting. You can take two. You can only take one if you want. You're not forced to take more than one. Many students will take the three, and it will be less time than the SAT or the ACT. Subject tests are offered on most days that an SAT is offered, but you do need to check. And when you go to register for an SAT in a subject test, you'll be able to tell. So you want to sign up with College Board. They usually give the dates that subject tests are being offered. Again, they are offered by College Board. That is where your scores will lie once they come in. Over 30 different AP tests are available typically offered at your high school during the first two weeks of May. Scores of three or higher may fulfill college requirements. Generally, colleges like to see fours and fives though. And even if you do earn a five, it doesn't mean that every single five that you get will be accepted at the college. Some elite colleges will only take a certain few AP exams. They want you to complete more of, your, of their curriculum when you attend their college. So an AP test demonstrates that you have mastered the subject, but you also, you have more to learn with it. Now, additional tests are your international baccalaureate tests, which are given generally in June. It's important for you. Many kids who go to IB schools choose to take those exams. Tests of English proficiency and for as a foreign language student or an international student, many colleges will ask them to take a, what's called a TOEFL or an IELTS, IELTS. And these are tests that basically you'll be taking to show proficiency. You have to get a certain score in order to be able to attend their college you have the opportunity to take it several times. If you are living in another country, it's important for you to know where your local testing 
sites are. I've had many students in other countries have to, it's a day trip to get to the closest one. So make sure that you are able to do that and schedule it and, and schedule your baseline tests as well as your uh, the next tests in order to improve the scores. A TOEFL or an IELTS will be, will be expected from most if English is not your first language. So please be prepared for that and know that they give fewer. So it's important for you to plan ahead. I really encourage students who are in uh, almost through with high school. So in that class before many schools, international schools only go through a junior year. I would want you to start taking that in your sophomore year. So have uh, just uh, have an understanding that it may not be the easiest location, so plan ahead. Testing accommodations. It has been challenging this year with COVID. It has made it uh, difficult in what now ACT and SAT are requiring that it's, that it's actually approved each time with your school counselor. So it's important for you to do the initial assessment when you're applying, let your school counselor know. Your school counselor will then put it through the accommodations and the paperwork that supports that you qualify. Hopefully, the, it'll be a one-time thing. Um, you need to allow two to three months. So if you're heading into your junior year, it would be important for you around October and November of your junior year to start working on that and going to your school counselor and letting them know that you would like to start working on having accommodations. Also, if you are planning on taking your PSAT in your junior year, then you would want to start working on submitting your accommodations at the end of your sophomore year. So please take the time to do that. It's important and it does take two to three months. You want to take practice tests to gain confidence and master time management. Many people get extended time. They have proven that people who require extended time, if they use it well, then it actually helps improve their score. So don't be concerned if one of your accommodations is extended time. It's, it's extended time for a reason take advantage of it. So you want to evaluate both test company accommodation policies and you want to make sure that you put them into both just in case you decide to take both. You don't want to have that be a problem. Standardized test tips. So you want to make a testing plan based on life. If you know you're going away and over Christmas break, you do not want to schedule an SAT or an ACT. You want to register early and make sure that that goes along with the family calendar. <laughs> it's a bummer when you have to move your testing date and they actually don't refund you fully. If you miss a registration date, you can request a place on the waiting list, but that does not guarantee that you will get one. You can go. I've had several kids show up and um, they ended up being able to take it. There is no guarantee that you will get a seat, so just be prepared, but show up early and get in line. Remind yourself that standardized testing is only one of the many decisions. There are all kinds of ways that you can present yourself. If you look back, one of our second videos on how to become a 3D Remind applicant. Remind yourself that standardized scores are just one piece of it. Remember, you have all the other pieces in this application process. So plan ahead, take your tests with confidence, study, and build test prep in, and that will help you a lot. So I hope I covered everything. I hope that I answered a lot of your questions. The only other thing that I would like to cover, if you qualify for free and reduced lunch, it is important for you to go see the person who handles either your college information or your school counselor, and you need to get a waiver. Do not apply for testing until you have that waiver. That waiver will help you be able to take the test for free. 
And that will also help you when you're getting ready to apply to colleges. If you have a waiver for an SAT or an ACT, then that automatically qualifies you to apply to several colleges for free. I can't stress that enough. Have patience. So many times people who qualify for a waiver have to wait until school is open and the school counselor or the college planner gets the new school year waivers. Have the patience for that and don't worry about it. Even if you're in your senior year, wait until you get that waiver. It will help you out a lot. I hope that helps. This is The Coaching Educator with Rebecca M. Carroll. Please like and share. And we'll see you next week. Thank you.